Good afternoon and welcome to the National Audubon Society's discussion, Black Leadership in Conservation. I'm Danita Wickwire, Audubon's Vice President of Principal Giving, and it is my pleasure to moderate what promises to be a dynamic conversation. I'm joined today by John B. Good, Audubon's Vice President of Pacific and Central Flyways and Marshall Johnson, Audubon's new Chief Conservation Officer. They both will share their journey and experiences as Black leaders in the world of conservation. John B. Good brings more than 15 years of advocacy and nonprofit experience to Audubon, including extensive expertise in developing advocacy campaigns, organizing, mobilizing volunteers, and creating organizational infrastructure. John B. has designed and led thematic issue campaigns attracting media coverage from major outlets, including the New York Times, Politico, and The Daily Show. Prior to Audubon, she served as Deputy Executive Director for Campaigns and Membership at Amnesty International USA. She's also worked with Greenpeace, Save the Bay, and The Nature Conservancy. John B. holds a bachelor's degree in political science and history from Virginia Tech. Go Hokies and welcome John B. Marshall Johnson. Marshall Johnson is Audubon's chief conservation officer. Marshall joined Audubon 12 years ago, starting as a climate field organizer for the DC policy team. Since 2012, Marshall has served as vice president Executive Director of Audubon Dakota and has thrived in building a mission moored, highly impactful team and state program. Marshall has also served as Vice President of Audubon's Conservation Ranching Initiative, now America's largest regenerative bird friendly land certification with endless promise of bringing grassland birds back while serving as a critical natural climate solution across North America's fragile grasslands. Welcome, Marshall. Thank you both for your leadership and for your inspiration. It is an honor to be with you today. And I've known you both for a little while, but I hope you both will take a moment to explain your roles in a little more detail. Jambi? Yeah, sure. I can go first. Um, so at the National Audubon Society, I essentially am a regional vice president. Um, you know, we call those flyways, our regions. Um, but I work with our staff on the Pacific and the sort of southern part of our central flyway. And I have a lucky job to work with a, a variety of sort of executive directors of state offices and sort of coach them and their staff to success. Marshall. Thank you, John B. Um, you know, as the chief conservation officer, I lead overall science conservation strategy and the policy units of the National Audubon Society. Uh, we like to think about it with, along with the field, um, as John B. I've described, this is where the work is designed and this is where the work happens. This is where our intention, uh, this is the interface of our intention and our ambitions and the communities that we work with. So. Um, I like to think of the work as sort of being from uh, uh, the boreal forest in Canada to Bogota, uh, Colombia, and everywhere in between. Uh, all 50 states, we have a pre uh, presence, our 49 states, uh, we have a presence in and, and uh, we follow birds and we like to say birds tell us uh, where and how we should be working. So that's sort of the conservation department, if you will. Terrific. Well, thank you both for telling us more. And I feel that Audubon is a great place. It's wonderful to work in the conservation space and to be more in tune to the natural world. And I'm curious to hear from both of you, what experiences sparked your passion for the natural world? I can go first. Um, so in high school, I was lucky to grow up in a beautiful area of the country in the Appalachian Mountains, Oxford, Virginia, where Virginia Tech is. Um, but I was also lucky to get the opportunity to do an externship with a Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And I spent a couple of weeks working in the Bay, like li literally living on property um, with other high schoolers, just cleaning up what at the time was a pretty toxic environment in the Chesapeake Bay. 
Um, but what I learned is that what was happening in my part of Virginia and all throughout Virginia was creating a lot of pollution that was making it really toxic in the Bay. And that really sparked for me a sense of a broader community and a broader community around environmental work and conservation. Terrific. Yeah, for me, yeah, I'd love to, to share with you a story of uh, summer camping trips and a grandfather that, that uh, handed me down a shotgun or binoculars for for being out in nature, but but I, I don't actually have any of those those stories. Um, I grew up in the city, uh, just outside of Dallas, uh, Texas, and uh, Los Angeles, sort of half and half. We moved around uh, quite a bit, um, and the only uh, you know active connection or thinking about uh, the natural world that I can really remember was spending a lot of time in West Texas um, in Eastern. New Mexico, and there was something about that landscape, uh, something about the fact that whether people were Black, white, uh, uh, Latino, uh, everybody wore a cowboy hat. And there's something about <laughs> that being tied to the landscape, uh, grasslands that sort of caught my attention, but um, it was only a, a sort of mild spark. I, I, I really grew up um, on the blacktop, if you will, uh, with a deep longing for sort of something else um, but that was that was sort of my my I didn't really reconnect to it until college when I ended up in a sort of eight by ten uh, box uh, out on the prairie uh, looking at prairie chickens in a prairie chicken blind and, and that sort of it was an aha moment and made me think back to uh, th that time as a kid being in West Texas. Wow, those are both terrific stories, very important stories that started you on the path to where you are today, inspiring and working with others. And I would love it if you both could say a little more about how that path started with the spark and how it led to your work today and specifically how it led you to work with Audubon here and now today. Yeah, I could. Uh, pick up uh, sort of where I left off. Off, and um, again, I studied business management at the University of Minnesota. I was going to law school and wanted to be in politics some way. That that was the. the I, I didn't know anyone in uh, conservation, and, and certainly no one that looked like me uh, in conservation. I didn't have sort of that that understanding that there was opportunity there until um, you know spending that time in the prairie chicken blind getting more active in campus environmental and conservation uh, causes with new friends that studied uh, conservation biology and, and wildlife management. Um, and that sort of convinced me that I would not sort of take a gap year, but after graduation, I wanted to take some time to explore this. And it, it turned out to be a part-time field organizer job out of Fargo, North Dakota. So I moved here, um, found the job uh, shortly after that, um, and thought it would be sort of a six month exploration, get this out of my system. <laughs> uh, and, and that was, of course, you know, tw 12 or 13 years ago now. So, um, but that, that was my first um, experience working in conservation. And it also brought me back to the prairies um, and reconnected me with that uh, that spark from my childhood, and, and uh, I've been passionate about it ever since. Oh, that's terrific. And it's amazing how that happens. A six-month thing turns into um, your career. <laughs> um, there are some similarities um, between Marshall's story and mine in the sense that I went to college and afterwards I come from an academic family. And so I, I went to DC um, to do a couple of years, um, just sort of learning about nonprofits with completely the expectation that I would, like, to the point that I even took the LSAT twice, um, that I would go to law school or I'd go into academia. But as I got um, further into my career at nonprofits, I realized there was just such a vibrant sort of a level of energy in field work and organizing and campaigning. Um, I also realized that I had a, a strong sort of talent as far as working with people and managing staff that it
I realized, oh, I'm actually never going to go back and go to law school. Um, so then I have moved back and forth between environmental work and human rights work. And, and over the, my career, uh, also started to realize that there should be an integration between both of those things, especially looking at work through an environmental justice, climate justice lens, and was really intrigued to come to Audubon to see how to do that climate justice work in, in the midst of a big organization that's focused on bird conservation. Oh, that's terrific. And, and Jambi, I must confess, I laughed a little bit as you told your story and referenced law school because once upon a time, I too was pre-law. <laughs> and, and here we all are working with the National Audubon Society. And Marshall, just, just continuing our conversation, you talked about not seeing anyone who looked like you as you began to pursue this work. And Jambi, I asked that question of you. Did you see anyone who looked like you? And just a question for both of you, people, individuals sure. of any color or background, who were your role models as you began to pursue this work and move forward to conservation and conservation justice? Yeah, I can start. Um... No, I did not see a lot of people like me. I, I think it's changing a little bit, but it's really quite common even now that I'll, I'll go into a room and folks will think that I'm there to be the administrative help. Like that happens, I would say like once a month. Um, so there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I was very lucky, I think, especially because I do sort of um, have my foot in the human rights space and the human rights space, especially the global human rights space looks a little different. And so I've had a lot of wonderful mentors, especially on that side that that helped me push through what can be an awkward space when you're one of the few people of color, you might be the only black woman um, in a lot of different in different spaces um, and in sort of work moments, especially with like travel. I've traveled all around the world. And so I've, I've definitely experienced some awkward experiences. Um, super unique. <laughs> yeah, very similar. When I, I started out, uh, there weren't, weren't many, um, weren't a lot, which is, you know, um, uh, kind of still surprising to say. And, and, and um, when I, I think back to uh, it, it really started for me as as a kid, and I remember a conversation. It's probably a series of of conversations with with my dad, where he would just tell me that because uh, I I at a young age I was going to sort of march to the beat of my own drum. That was pretty obvious. I'm the youngest of of nine brothers and sisters, and um, it was pretty clear I was going to go. I was going to have different interests than than pretty much everybody else, and. Um, I remember my dad sitting me down and telling me, uh, uh, you, the, the way you, you approach life, you're going to find yourselves where you find yourself being maybe the only black person a lot of times, um, uh, cause you have different interests. And he, and he told me, I'll never forget. He said, uh, don't ever let that hold you back. Uh, always know that you belong. Um, and second, he said, don't always, don't ever forget it either. Don't ever forget that you're a black person in a room and you're the only don't ever don't ever ignore that and and so um that's that's sort of how it started out and and how i've sort of never uh, thought twice about um uh being limited by it that uh but also never forgetting it and um much like jambi i had three great mentors early on in my career uh dr eric burgess uh, who was at the University of Minnesota. Now he teaches at a historically black college in Missouri. Um, Dr. John Challey was a board member here at Audubon, Dakota. Uh, and Roger Steele was someone that uh, those, those three mentors in my life uh, really shaped my early career and uh, really helped give, helped give uh, purpose to my career. And I, I can't thank them enough. And I think mentorship is, is really important. I agree that mentoring aspect is critical for all of us. It's, it's essential for people of color in any field, especially going into a field where there aren't many people who look like you. In the development field, I didn't meet another, I didn't meet another Black fundraiser until 
I'd been working in the field for about 12 years. And that was the first time I met a black fundraiser who didn't work for an HBCU, which is tremendous work, or for a small nonprofit organization. So it's important that we, we have something in ourselves to guide us and mentoring and terrific advice like your father's advice. And that actually brings me to a question that just came in from Denitra on Zoom, lovely name, Denitra. She has a relevant question, and that is, what encouraging words would you give to your younger self that would, that would have, excuse me, that would have gotten you on your path sooner in life? Uh, you know, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer for you. I, I, I really don't because I, I, um, I sort of decided upon this track fairly early in life and was exposed uh, sort of serendipitously to leadership opportunities early on that really kept my excitement going for um, and felt and, and helped me feel like I belong. Um, and that ha happened really early in life. And so I don't know, John B, maybe you have some, some more keen advice here. Um, well, you know, I do think it's common for, for folks to say it gets better. And I think my take on that would be sometimes it does, but frequently it actually gets harder. It gets more challenging, but you get stronger. And so just sort of comforting my younger self that like you get more talent, you get, you get more experience. It's easier to like work through the failures and the mistakes. You just get stronger. And so I think that would have been a comfort to myself as a younger person. I think the other thing I would add on just as advice to folks who are younger in there or, or newer in this profession is be open to those like opportunities and those pivots. Like what I thought I would do at 25 is not what I am doing in my forties. Um, and thank goodness, cause I had a really limited view of like what success could look like. And I thought it was like, oh, it was like one step after another, just going in a certain ladder. And that's, I don't think that's most people's lives. And I actually don't think that's a great, uh, great map to success. Success. I agree. I think about so many of the things that I that were important to me, what success looks like when I was in my 20s and in my 30s. And I'm not going to keep going, but at different <laughs> different decades in my life, what how my values, my core values have remained the same, but some of the tangential interests and intersections have modified through the years. And to your point, John B, yes, we do get stronger and things get harder. And speaking of stronger, um, we have a comment from Ari on Zoom who says, and I quote, all my experiences have been the same as the panelists. I'm inspired to meet other people of color in conservation. Some people have called me an anomaly. So just looking at that question, I'm curious, what, what do the two of you have to say to Ari and to others who are interested in pursuing either work in conservation or work in a path where there aren't many people who look like our listeners and viewers today? Zombie? Sure. Um, I do think one of the things that has really been crystallized, unfortunately, through the pandemic, but it, it, it's that we do have this, um, all of the technology to connect us, even if you are in a really a, a rural area where there may not be other Black professionals in conservation, there is the ability to connect to a broader network of folks out there. And we're not anomalies. There's actually a lot of us, but we may not, you may not feel that way in certain parts of the country or in certain organizations. Um, and so I just encourage people to use the technology we have to make those connections. I think there's a lot of power in that. I know that from doing political organizing, there's definitely power that way. But I also think in creating community, that can be really helpful. I know for myself, I would not be in the position I'm, I'm in without my broader network of folks in my, who have supported me in my community. Um, and I'm always happy to do that for others. So I think making those sort of connections to the virtual sphere can really help people move forward with their careers. Marshall? Yeah, I think that's great advice, uh, Jambi. Uh, and Ari, 
you know, I'm, I'm a black man in Fargo, North Dakota working uh, <laughs> and I wear a, a cowboy hat, right? So uh, talk about anomaly, uh, but, but uh, in terms of, of um, you know, it, it's, it's very much, you know, my experience of being the only, um, what I hope, um, and, and we can't take too much time with this, but what I hope is over time, as we see more and more uh, folks like John B, folks like myself, uh, we see it on the governmental side, on the federal and state agency side, a lot of leadership. I think more and more people of color see themselves uh, in conservation and see an opportunity to be in conservation. But I, I would, I, I will challenge my organization. I challenge would challenge other organizations that again it's about having that representation but also building the work in a way that takes into account and includes um, at, at its core communities of color so you're hiring from those communities you're working in those communities working on behalf of those communities listening to those communities it's it's it, it starts sort of with that representation and, and it um, should be, become more ingrained as the work um, is built in partnership with all communities, particularly communities of color. Terrific. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Jambi. And Marshall, I'm going to pick up on that thread a little bit with what is Audubon doing and what can Audubon do? And this is for both of you. So you both have backgrounds in policy and advocacy work. And with this in mind, what insights do you have on the types of policies that Audubon can create or support that will directly address the inequities and the issues of environmental justice? That's a great question. And, and it's something that uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time on is we're, we're, it's a really good time for Audubon um, as it relates to a lot of things, but as it particularly relates to um, uh, more deep integration of environmental justice uh, into our work uh, because we're starting our strategic planning process. And that gives you this chance to really not merely start over, but um, uh, really prioritize maybe areas that haven't been traditionally prioritized. And so right now, we're, the conservation leadership team is working with the um, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging leadership to really sketch out what is the next year as we're planning our conservation work. We want to start by evaluating where we are um, on e environmental justice, EDIB, um, and how we build a set of principles that actually informs and guides how we view our role as, as a bird conservation organization. So I'm incredibly excited about really building the foundation of EDIB and environmental justice um, and building our conservation uh, architecture off of that are, are at the very least uh, with those sensibility and that sensibilities and, and um, uh, increased awareness across the conservation leadership team. That's sort of a first step, but of course we have, we've got to do a lot, lot more. Um, Jambi? Yeah, I, I would just build on that with, I think a lot of the big green organizations and I've worked for a number of them are going through a bit of a reckoning with their history and especially the history of being white focused conservation organizations and all that goes into that like hundred years. And so we do have an opportunity of changing how we work with other groups. And I'm especially excited to be working with a cross-functional team at Audubon our sort of environmental justice working group to be talking about how we do the work, not just what policies are we focused on, but how do we do that work? How do we do it in real partnership with BIPOC and grassroots community groups? How do we have real partnership with indigenous groups and change, I think, for the good, how we are operating in conservation and in environmental justice? So I, I, I do see this, I, I think there is sort of two parts to it is really a reckoning about what has been our past 
And that's not just for Audubon, that's a broader conservation movement thing that has to go, I think we have to go through. But also it gives us the space to, I think, think through different ways to do the work and do that really in partnership. So we're not just coming in and advocating for a policy that we think would work well with say native communities. We are actually having those relationships with native communities, working together to create a policy that we are advocating on. That's terrific. Thank you both for, for those very, very thoughtful comments. There's, there's work that's been done and more opportunities and work before us. And speaking of the work that's been done and the reckoning that so many groups are going through, have gone through already, what progress have you seen towards racial equity in the conservation movement? Tell me. <laughs> I really was hoping Marshall would take that one. Um, I mean, I think there's been a little bit of progress. I, you know, I would have to say, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. Unfortunately, a lot of the history of the conservation movement is really rooted in some pretty racist and, and white supremacist views. Um, and I know for, at Audubon, we're, we're just sort of embarking at looking at the legacy of John Jay Audubon, who we are named after, but was not one of our founders. Um, as far as progress, I mean, I do think, again, you know, looking at the leadership of different big green organizations, you are slowly but surely seeing a very different group of people in leadership. Um, I think you're also seeing a different approach about how we're doing that work. I know as someone who manages different states, especially out West, I'm really pleased to see the relationships that are being built with BIPOC communities and with native communities from Alaska to uh, New Mexico for the states that I manage. So I do think there's been incre incremental change, but I also see, I share the frustration that I think many have on wanting to see the conservation movement move much more aggressively in that way. I also, I also feel like as someone who moves back and forth between human rights and conservation and environmental justice work, that even the term conservation probably needs to be, uh, there needs to be some analysis about why we car call ourselves that and whether or not that really fits in our, with our equity, diversity, inclusion values. Wow. Yeah, building off of, uh... Uh, John B's uh, comments, you know, I think it, it is a, a really gives me a lot of hope to see, you know, on the agency side, um, the uh, superintendent of, of the Forest Service is a Black man, uh, EPA, um, uh, Deb Holland, um, a member of the Laguna Pueblo, uh, leading interior, uh, on and on and on. That, that's, that gives me a lot of hope um, uh, that, that, uh, but again, to Jami's point, it, it, it's got to go beyond just the representation and, and we really need to build our work um, with community colors, uh, of communities of color in mind and um, making sure that our work doesn't disproportionately uh, negatively affect communities of color. Uh, we work a lot, for instance, on green space and green space uh, can be a really positive thing if we're doing it uh, in an equitable uh, fashion. It can also be a driver of regentrification and, and other uh, policies uh, that displace uh, uh, black and brown people. So really being um, aware, uh, being, uh, you're we're not gonna be perfect, uh, but being aware uh, being really uh, deliberate about how we go about our work is, is, I think, are a couple of really first good steps. Terrific, terrific. You both addressed a lot of challenges in, in the work itself and in the pace forward. If there are other challenges, what would you name as additional challenges as well as additional opportunities in this work? You know, one challenge or opportunity, I've worked a lot in agriculture and with farmers and ranchers and um, worked with just amazing people, uh, literally hundreds of farmers and ranchers that I would, would, would call uh, really good friends um, over the years. And it started working on bird conservation and finding mutually beneficial um, areas to partner. Uh, but obviously during that time, I, 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 worked with hundreds and hundreds of uh, farmers and ranchers, uh, almost to a person, really great people, and to a person, never Black. 
Um, and, and knowing sort of that history of how we, we got here, I think it's really important that we find opportunities to bring more people into farming and ranching. Um, because as we, far, uh, food drives, um, in more ways than I think we really appreciate, food drives positive and negative outcomes uh, for conservation and for birds. And we have to get that right. And I know personally three or four professional athletes. I know personally that came from my communities, no one that is a farmer or rancher, uh, right? So we have to, for the sake of the farming and ranching uh, uh, community. And so people, we often say people are too disconnected from how food is raised. Well, one of the reasons why is because people that look like me don't have land or have been um, uh, uprooted from their land and displaced from their historic land. And so that actually drives a disconnect for what is now the majority of communities, right? We are uh, nearing or are recently past a point where the majority are, are quickly the majority of, of Americans will be people of color. Uh, and so uh, I think that's a huge vulnerability and an opportunity within working lands and agriculture uh, to become more diverse, to bring, build a bigger tent. Uh, so there's deeper connectivity to communities of color and, and more, more and more farming and ranching communities can uh, be communities of color uh, themselves. Thank you, Marshall. I would just add going kind of in a different direction. Um, another challenge is just the diversification of our membership and our donors. I think we, like many big organizations, have a lot of folks who are older, but not as many folks from like 20 to even like 45, like that whole sort of space. There's a lot less folks engaging in environmental work, being a, a, a member, you know, giving donations. And so I, I think not, not again, just for Audubon, but the broader movement mm -hmm. needs to figure out how to diversify our funding streams and and also there's a power in that diversification if the if the only only older white folks are the ones who are providing fu funding it makes sense then that big you know ngos are leaning towards you know a, a, a an agenda that is leaning towards the needs of, of one smaller group of the broader society and so my hope is that we can think through, especially as this sort of generational shift happens um, with funders, we can th think through how to diversify our funding streams and who gives money to these organizations and participates in the in sort of the leading of these organizations. John B, you're referencing a virtuous circle, and that is something that's critical to my work as a fundraising professional. Again, I didn't see anyone who looked like me for a number of years, but I'm starting to see more and a lot more specifically in the conservation organizations. And when we think about EDI and B, many times the conversation is how can we get people to support equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging efforts. But part of the conversation that we have at Audubon and the development team and in the principal giving team is, well, how can we bring in more people of color to support all of our work, including equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging? How can we have more of those conversations? And you know, this conversation in and of itself is part of that, just showing the Black leadership that is in the conservation movement. So someone's watching this and they're thinking about their philanthropic investments, they'll see that they're not the only one looking at and thinking, about Audubon and conservation in general. And John B, I also want to, I'm looking at a question that just came in. I want to go back to something that you stated once again. Um, Marlena is, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, Marlena. Marlena on Zoom asks, well, she states, thanks John B for questioning the term conservation and the challenges it poses for many communities. How do we bring in or find common ground with communities, especially marginalized communities who are involved in creating environmental change, but don't see themselves as conservationists? 
Yeah, I've I've absolutely worked with those communities. I've definitely had a sort of a back and forth relationship with the term conservation um, conservation myself, and and rarely call myself a conservationist. It feels like, as much as I'm personally a history uh, major in college, and 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 want to talk about what what is the foundation of our current situation, which is our history. Um, I feel like conservationist is a a term that looks backwards and tries to maintain a status quo, which frequently for marginalized communities is not an equitable or a fair situation to try to maintain. Um, I think the way that we change this is again, those genuine relationships with the BIPOC communities and grassroots communities so that you're using the language and you're you're setting up an agenda that's forward facing and makes sense and is in a language that both groups can can feel good about. Um, so yes, I, I don't I'm not I'm not to the point that I'm advocating absolutely we don't use the word conservation. I know that it's also rooted in wanting to do right by the natural world. But frequently, if you look at the language that groups like Audubon used back at the turn of the last century, it, it's ignoring things like native populations, it's ignoring black and brown communities. It's seeing the world as pers- the natural natural world as pristine. And pristine means those folks are not in it at that point. That's what they were they were they meant by that language. And I, I do want to pivot away from that. I also want to again, be open and transparent and honest about the foundations of the conservation movement. I think that's the only way that we can kind of reckon with it and move through it. I think John B, John B has the final word. I, I can't I have nothing to add. That, that was perfect. Terrific, terrific. Well, we do have a number of other questions coming in from the audience and questions and comments. So the first one that I'm reading and before me, Morgan on Zoom says, it's great to do what you love, but work is still work. Has working in conservation dampened your ability to enjoy being out in nature or does it make you appreciate it more? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say that work, and I'm, I'm a bit of a workaholic, um, but my work traditionally has taken me to farms and ranches, uh, taken me um, on hunting trips and um, um, so many different places that um, I would probably be stuck behind a computer if I didn't uh, <laughs> need to get out and 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 spend time. So I, I'd say I'd say no. I'd say work has actually um, uh, provided more impetus and opportunities uh, to get out in nature and enjoy nature. And I, I don't think I do it enough. Uh, particularly, strangely, for me, um, because I am maybe it is tied to being a workaholic. Um, the pandemic has has created a disconnect for me personally, because I'm not out meeting with people and, and traveling and, you know, in my truck, you know, uh, visiting with, with uh, landowners. Uh, so I, I actually have not been out in nature as much as pre-pandemic, which is very different than most people still. So. Yeah, I before the pandemic, I'd only been at Audubon for a couple of months. And what was wonderful is that every couple of weeks, we would actually be out in nature. And that was just a lovely sort of change in comparison to previous positions I had had. Obviously, the pandemic changed a lot of that, but I've had the opportunity to do a few trips, um, including a trip to the Arctic refuge um, through a initiative with a variety of conservation groups and native um, native leaders to talk about the um, preservation of the Arctic refuge. And I'm not an outdoorsy outdoorsy person. I, I love the outdoors, but I am not someone who goes camping. And I actually camped for 10 days um, a, a completely away from all the normal luxuries like you know bathrooms and whatnot that I normally enjoy um, and it was wonderful it was really kind of life affirming and life changing so I feel very lucky to work in an organization where I get opportunities to be like 
not just opportunities to be in nature, but opportunities that are highly encouraged, sometimes push me way outside of my comfort zone, but really give me, I think, an opportunity to connect back to the land. Now, thank you both for your great comments there. And Jambi, especially your experience in the Arctic. I've, I've received an invitation to go to the Boreal Forest and stay in a lodge and it's on my list. I've encouraged my eight-year-old son to come with me. He's not, not as interested, but that's okay. <laughs> We've got a few more questions <laughs> and um, we'll figure out what my son's going to do later. A few questions <laughs> in a similar vein. Do you feel that as a black conservation profession, as black conservation professionals, you have a different perspective on the work than your white counterparts in the field in any way? Or in other words, how does being a person of color impact your work? Oh, wow. Um, absolutely, I think, every, absolutely. Um, uh, I, it, it'd probably be a little bit difficult for me um, uh, to compare and contrast, but, but yes, I have a different perspective on, on the work um, then I, th I think some, uh, most of my colleagues, um, have I actively thought they are attributed to my background? Um, maybe not as much as I will after you ask me that question. I'm certainly going to spend more time on it, but yes, I think, I think it's certainly my experiences, uh, uh, drive a certain perspective that, uh, if I hadn't had those experiences as, as a black man, um, and uh, seeing experience and in, 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 uh, uh, being a part of experiences um, had on the part of my uh, Black mother, uh, aunts, um, and, and understanding at least a, a, a portion of the experience of Black females, which is aligned and, and similar, but very different and um, uh, very different than my own. Um, as a man, there are certain privileges, even as a black man, that I have um, that are not always extended uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, people that look like my mother, my aunts, or Jambi, or, or Danita. So um, yes, I, I know that that absolutely drives um, a difference in my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say all of the, the pieces of my identity affect the leadership that I bring to conservation and environmental justice work, you know, both being Black, but being a woman, growing up in the South, growing up in Appalachia in a rural community, there's just, there's a lot there. Um, and I, you know, as, you know, hearkening back to the advice that Marshall's dad gave him, I too, when I'm in those spaces, especially if I'm that one black person in the space, I do feel I need to represent um, and make sure mm -hmm. those identities are part of the conversation. Because sometimes I'm in spaces where it's that those all of those identities that I represent are not part of the conversation. Jambi, that leads right into the next question uh, very directly for both of you. Whitney on Zoom asks, do you find that others isolate you to discussions revolving around inclusion and diversity or are pathways open to the larger conservation conversation and work? Jambi, paper, rock, scissors. Um, I actually had a little bit of a technical glitch, so Marshall, you can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yes. It. It. Uh, I embrace it. Um, I. But I would would caution uh, folks, uh, particularly uh, some of our uh, white uh, listeners and, and participants today. Um, that's not my obligation. My obligation as a black professional is not to answer. Um, every question that you have uh, about race or racism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think you, I would encourage folks to really tread carefully because it can be burdensome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you there's a, a burden and a, um, uh, a, a load that, that we have to carry in, in answering uh, uh, questions. And, and so, uh, and sometimes whether you know it or, or not, 
there's microaggressions that are uh, that drive some of the questions that that can be answered uh, or asked. Excuse me. So I would caution that. Now, me personally, uh, if I had a, a dollar for every time a a rancher or farmer something was on the news about race or or, or racism and I wasn't their first call, I, 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 I would be rich. <laughs> um, it comes up a lot and it comes up a lot because of the way I look um, and a part of my identity. I embrace those conversations. Um, but again, many many people don't uh, embrace those, those conversations. So it's really uh, important to, to um, uh, not just randomly ask a person of color to engage <laughs> in the topic. It's not their responsibility and they don't owe you an answer. They don't owe you anything. Um, now, again, I, 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 I embrace those conversations. Um, so that, that, but that is really just me. Um, did you get a sense of the question, John B? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> I, so, so completely agree with Marshall. I would say a couple more things. I think I find myself in it a little bit of attention because yes, it's really exhausting, but I do, I, I want things to get better. And so sometimes I wind up leaning into spaces, having to frequently clean up situations that other colleagues have created that are problematic around equity, diversity, inclusion, not my real, not actually my responsibility, but winds up being something that either they expect me to clean up or I feel obligated to do it. Not, I don't, I don't have to, but I really want the organization, the colleague, the situation to be better. And so I realize that I have some say in that and I find it to be a balancing act as a leader because you do not want situations that are really problematic on equity, diversity, inclusion to be happening, but also it shouldn't be just the black leaders that have to like clean up the situations or set the direction. So it, I, it is, I think, really complicated and hard and exhausting is a good way to describe it. Is there such a thing as racial battle fatigue? And there have been several presentations on that and writings, just um, how the conversations, the questions, and that burden, that extra weight, that unpaid labor affects people physically, psychically, and otherwise. And I'm looking at the time. There's still a number of terrific questions. I think we have time for two more, I hope. And there's a comment and question from Donald. Very exciting question. Donald says, I'm a black nature photographer and I've contributed to Audubon for 30 years or so as a member and winner of Audubon photography contests and such. Congratulations, Donald. Today is the first time I have seen black Audubon employees and conservationists. We're glad you're here, Donald. Absolutely. And Donald, I'm personally thrilled to know you're a photographer. My background is in the fine arts too. And I don't always see people who look like me in that space either. Um, and I think this is going to be our last question. I do have another question for you guys, but this might be the last question from the group. Sunshine from Zoom wants to know that given our current obstacles with climate change, what do you both foresee in the future as opportunities for BIPOC people to lead in the effort to conserve biodiversity, wildlife, and habitats? Jambi? Um, um, well, I think first and foremost, you need to start and you know start locally. It's really important to be aware of what opportunities you have in your local environment. That's that's anything from how are you engaging with issues around climate, what is your climate footprint, to you know, how is energy and resources happening in your locality. I think the second piece is I, you know, the one that I, I I'm sure people realize, but we all should be much more engaged on, which is the political space and making sure you are voting, that you are actively engaging, especially with your state legislature, um, as well as the federal, your federal representation. Um, I, I see climate as probably the biggest issue we, uh, that will impact all the other issues of the course of the next couple of decades. And I think we all just need to be engaged and be ready to you know, have be part of this fight for, the next few decades until we get to a much stronger position on climate mitigation. Marshall? 
Yeah, like great, great words, uh, John B. Um, and the only thing I would, would underscore or add to is just really um, flexing your political power. You know, if, um, if you're on this, this Zoom, you care about nature. Um, and uh, I think uh, people of, of color um, have a really outsized opportunity and role to play in protecting um, uh, the climate um, for, for us all um, and, and really flexing your political power. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity uh, there. And, and as people that purchase things and, and, and we get to select choice, um, a lot of people fought for my ability to make choices um, and make the choices that I want to make. And, and so um, w whether it's the brands that you support or um, choices that you make in the marketplace, that's an incredible power or for birders in general, but particularly Black nat naturalists and, and uh, uh, Black and Brown lovers of nature um, in the climate fight. We're going to have to make choices that root out uh, polluters and, and root out, um, uh, 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 you know, bad, again, bad choices and select choices that are better for birds and better for uh, the climate. Um, and in many cases, we have that choice, not in every case, but in many cases, we as people of color have uh, that choice to make. Terrific. Wonderful. Thank you both. This has been a wonderful conversation, pardon me. And I do have a final comment from Marguerite from Zoom. She says, this is a really good presentation, really engaging and informative. Thank you for doing this. As an African-American philanthropic advisor and lover of parks, fields, and open spaces, and a former board member of Audubon Great Lakes, I'm heartened to know that you're doing work that is so important to our world, our communities and life itself. Thank you for bringing our lives and experiences to the field. Thank you for being open, transparent and hopeful. And as we wrap up Marshall and Jambi, I just want to Thank you both for your leadership and inspiration and ask if you have any final parting words for all of our wonderful audience members who've joined us today. You know, I just really appreciate um, the conversation. I uh, really appreciate the ability. Thank you, Danita, for uh, being such a great host and um, you. Uh, you and your team and, Preeti and, and her team pulling this together. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation and more than anything, thank you all for listening. I, I hope you got uh, something, uh, nuggets out of it uh, along the way. Yes, echoing the thanks. And I would say the work is hard, but I do think birding and nature is a great balm. So I encourage everyone to just get out there, do some forest bathing. It's, it's challenging times, but we do have you know, nature as an opportunity to heal our souls. Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you both again. Thank you all for joining our conversation and presenting really terrific questions. And again, a special thanks to Jambi and Marshall for taking time out of your busy days to join us today and for inspiring so many of us every day. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and happy Black History Month. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.